Well, good morning. Here we go again. Father God, we just come to you and we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing here in Iowa and transforming lives. Father, we make a demand by faith on the Holy Spirit that you, you show up and stay in this place. Yes. That your presence be, <clears throat> be felt all throughout this, this area. That this church be a light shining on a hill. That it have influence and impact and leave a legacy into what it's called to do here in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One of the great things I like about Steve Castle is honesty. <laughs> and and uh, <clears throat> besides growing a good beard, um, this morning I came down about 20 after 8 and went over and had some breakfast. So I'm sitting there and I said, would you like to join me for breakfast? Or a cup of coffee or something. And he goes, no. And then he looked down and kept doing what he was doing. I said, did I do something wrong? But there was nothing wrong. You know, the Bible says, let your yes be yes, your no be no. And sometimes we feel like we have to explain ourselves or placate somebody and not just tell the truth. Did you want to go? No. That's it. There's nothing wrong. Everything's fine. So I'm like, all right. You know, went and had breakfast anyway. And <clears throat> there's no issue. But it, it is good to develop character enough to say yes and to say no and not have to feel like you have to op oh I go oh. explain yourself just just to, that's it it's very simple but but it's sometimes it's difficult so that was uh, that was a great thing and I enjoyed that this morning um, last night we were talking about starting to build teams how to do that and having a personal team, pouring into the personal team, I don't think you can get anything done without the use of teams or without, the, you, it's just impossible to get anything done without a team. Um, but it doesn't stop just with who you are mentoring. You also have to have a team uh, of advisors mm -hmm. that, that are ahead of you. So we have an advisory <coughs> team. And then we also have a team of co-laborers that are involved in the same sorts of things that we're involved in. Um, <clears throat> River City Recovery Ministries had a horrible, horrible name. There it is. I'm looking for this. Had a horrible name. And through teamwork, we've been able to, to transform or change that. And so today... We team with Delwood, which is a secular, regular treatment center. They had an inpatient program for 30 years. And when someone would finish their program, those who needed extra help would come and live with us. And they were like a feeder to our uh, recovery center. And so we were normally full. When you only have 25 people once, and they stay, you know, usually four to five months, uh, four to eight months. When they stay months, we're not always looking for people. So it's not like we're going to go out and try and recruit aggressively. <clears throat> because by doing that, if we recruit aggressively and we always say we're full, then people will stop referring. Right? And so we had this relationship. And then in September, we decided to expand one house and have room for six more guys. And they, all of a sudden, contracted. And they stopped their inpatient program and went to a completely outpatient program. Then they came to us and said, we would like you to house people for us, and then they come to our program, our treatment, intensive treatment program. And so now they want to partner with us 
But in the beginning, five years ago, they didn't want anything to do with us. They would <clears throat> tell people not to come to the house of dope. And, and they, were, they, were, they, were, they were serious. So they came to us to partner. And it is a partnership that's working out. Uh, their class, we hold a class from 9 to noon, Tuesday through Friday. Their class is the same time as our class. So now, instead of them coming to us, they're going to intensive treatment. And they're coming back. We still have our community that they live in, but our class is less. And then as they graduate down from the intensity in their treatment, they get more involved in what we're doing. But that is a, that is a team effort. The counselors uh, there understand the clients have to have uh, time with us as well because we're their community. We're where they live. They, we understand they have to have time with the counselor. And so we've worked this relationship together, and it, it's still working out. We're still doing it, but <clears throat> they're on our team. Uh, First Baptist Church, and First Baptist Church has been involved. They only send us $100 a month, which means we're for you, but we're not sure how far. Because those people are loaded. <laughs> they really are. I mean, they uh, they're very benevolent in the community. <clears throat> but one of their one of their good standing members has been with me for the four years, and we t I trained him how to do this uh, recovery work. You have to have a certain stomach for it because there's a lot of uh, resistance and failure. And so they've been involved, and now we're holding a one day a week for the men. We're holding class in their building. So we go to their building, and they don't mind the drug addicts, criminals, in, in their building because they want to make, have influence and impact. So they're on our team. Um, word of Life is a their word... They're like us, a uh, word-based church with uh, Jim Caseman has done a Saturday service. We used to have the Saturday service. Uh, they took it over because I really believe that you do what the Lord's told you to do. Not You don't have to get involved in extra things. So they do the Saturday service. <clears throat> and they are, uh, they've built that up to where we owned the church on land contract and a build and a house. And so now at the end of February, they're going to purchase that from us. And we're going to be out of the responsibility of having church. However, we help them by financing it, by paying for it. We help them get, it's called TBO, we help them get that off the ground because there's no way they could have done it on their own because there was no money and no interest. And so they've done the work, but we have provided the atmosphere to do it. And, the, and they've done a great job. And so that will be a standalone work that they're going to use the house to house people who are beyond what we do. So you, when you come into River City, you're pretty rough. You know, the street, prison, you know, sometimes we detox people. Um, it, it's pretty rough. And so <clears throat> after you're done with us and you can pay your rent and you can get a job and you can act like a human being, then you would go to them. And it's got, that's called Mission 61. And we partner with them. So they're part of our team. The, uh, obviously, the NA and AA groups in the area are part of our team. It's all these entities working together that lift everybody up. I'm not trying to get anyone interested in River City Recovery. I'm finding out what is God doing and let's get involved in that. Because 
There's no one, maybe, I don't know, I don't care if you agree or not, uh, there's no one that can to meet all the needs. When, when you take on a project like addiction, it is so diverse and, and vast that you can break off chunks and there's one portion that you might be able to do better than you'll be able to do it, but together you cover both bases. In, in Steve Castle's area, there is a home for pregnant teenage mothers. Now, there's a certain criteria you have to have to get into the home. <laughs> you have to be pregnant. <laughs> and you have to be a woman. <laughs> That's pretty specific, right? And so by getting involved in what somebody's already doing, you can partner and team up and cover that area that they're not doing. Does that make sense? Amen. So we're talking about how do we build teams. It's getting involved in what's already going on, who is already meeting a need, and then what portion can you provide in that need. That opens the door. See the one question, Steve and I were talking, this one, Steve Castle, Steve Winters. Steve and I were talking is that if you have a, a pipeline, how do you get people in there? Where do we go? How do we, how do, we do that? <clears throat> how do we have, you know, in six months, how do you add 25 people to, uh, to the congregation here? How? Where are they? Well, we know this. They're alive. Right? They're there. You just don't know who they are. Isn't that fantastic? So there's no shortage of people. You know, if you lived in Montana on the top of a mountain, there might be a shortage of people. There's population, 15. Well, you can have a megachurch with nine guys. <laughs> but, but it's there. So that is the first thing we need to believe. The people are there. And, it, and it's not some mystical, magical, spiritual, over-spiritualized thing. It's just they, they, they're actually alive. But if you don't believe that they're there and you wonder, well, how do I do that? You are thinking of device. And, it really, and that's as far as you get. You're just thinking of, well, where, how, how, I don't know. You know and then that's, that's the lid. So just as when everybody went across yesterday, when the demand was made, the device showed up. So when the demand is made, the device shows up. <clears throat> We're normally not going to see the device until the demand is made. And so we'll sit back here going, God, how do I do this? How do I do this? And then there's nothing there. But as soon as we step out in faith, that's when we start to see what happens. Well, that's when we start to have these divine encounters. That's when we start to meet people. That, that fill this. Now, the cool thing is, this, the church here is filled with people who know people. Isn't that fantastic? <clears throat> and, and you have an assignment. Is there anybody that doesn't have an assignment from God? That was good. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, my wife hates that when I crack myself up. <laughs> Everybody has an assignment from God. So the church or the pastors have the vision to have the church, but how to fill the church comes from the people that are in the church. And they're here to guide, to help, to nourish, to uh, work with, to counsel, to guide you in doing the ministry God's called you to do. Does that make sense? Amen. It's not that hard. So what does the Lord put in your heart? You say, well, I, I want to minister more. Right? And, the, and that's your heart's desire. Well, you need a team. You need a team of people. You need to make yourself valuable 
to You need to make yourself valuable to the kingdom. And, and how we do that is, this is, and I'm not talking about you, right? I'm looking at you, but I'm not talking about you. This is not a hobby. Now, if your ministry is a hobby, that's fine. You know what I mean by hobby? It never gets professional. It's just something we do because we like to do it, and it's fun. Well, all right. Last night, I was exhausted. I had never felt exhausted like that before. And we, the three of us and, and Lynette went to Perkins. And I have all these thoughts racing through my head like, you need to just stop doing this. Go home. Just say, okay, this was nice, but let's be done. Cash out. This is all going through my brain last night. <clears throat> and I'm like, what is this? I would love to say it was him, but he's defeated. Right. He'll give you thoughts. So it is me being tired. And that's what I said. I'm tired. I think I'm tired. And then I told these two what I was thinking. <laughs> and they busted my chops. And it, it, it was hilarious. You know, they did it in love. But they're like, you're being stupid. Stop that. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that was that was that was Mr. Honesty there. And so huh. Well remember how yesterday you said that if oh gosh, am I phone? Um if Remember how yesterday you said that if we hear something from God, we're supposed to say it. Yeah. Right? So, <clears throat> my boyfriend, he's new to our church. And um, last night when we got home, I asked questions. I didn't, you know, prompt him. And he said he really, really, really liked you. And that um, things that you said resonated with him. Like and um, so... And he can't come to all the all of your guys' teachings, but like he really wants to come back tonight, and like that's huge. So I just want to encourage you that um, even though he was only here for three hours, <clears throat> he likes to sleep and he liked you, and he wants to come back. So, well, fantastic. Anyway. When I was tired. Actually, that, it didn't happen until I stopped. I sat down, and then it's like, pfft, I ran out of gas. Yeah. Right? Why am I saying this? Why am I bringing it up? I'm bringing it up to tell you that it's normal to have feelings of adversity yes. within you. It's just normal. It's okay. You don't, the only reason I'm bringing it up is to teaching illustration. Otherwise, it's left yesterday. I appreciate that. Thank you. But that's, that's all. It's not the devil. It's just, I was tired, and I started thinking wrong. That's it. It's that simple. And I know if I go through it, I'm hoping somebody else does from time to time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we can go, oh, this is normal. All right, get some rest, and, and then we're fine. And that's what happened. I got some rest, and we're fine. <clears throat> so building these teams, making yourself valuable in your community, that's where... You come in. That's where the church comes in. What, what are you assigned to do under the umbrella of LifePoint? <clears throat> now, you, you, you want to be careful of just attracting needy and broke folks. We want to minister to them. But if you fill the whole place with broke folks, you're going to be broke. There are people that have a heart for God, that have a mission 
they're called to do, that we're supposed to, you're supposed to partner with to get that mission done. That are stable, that, that believe in God, that are mature. That's how you disciple is through maturity. Right. And they exist and they're there. And they have a common mission. When we started New Wine Church, I found people with a, that were mature, that had a common mission, that wanted to do addiction recovery ministry. And so we worked together on it until we didn't. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So there are people there. There are competent people, but you have to introduce yourself to them. I thought I put one of these pieces of paper up here that I wanted to go over some more. Okay. A couple more things about teams. of Advisory teams. This is the one I was looking for. Advisory teams. Um, I call them extended teams. The ones that are other entities that you're working with. Extended teams. Um, your own personal team. There's functional teams where if you have a church and you have 10 ushers, then it's pretty, you know, once you learn how to do that, then that's, that's it. That's a function that, that you do. But you could have three out of those ten get together and have a building team. So there's functional teams and building teams. Functional teams take care of things that need to be taken care of. Building teams come together, search God about how to do it better. How to increase. How do we how can we be a blessing to what's going on and what's happening here? And so it's okay to have a functional team. Someone comes in off of the street, you're not going to put them on the platform, but someone comes in off the street, they want to find a place to fit. So they can go on a functional team and they can do something. How do you define a functional team again? How would we define a functional team? <clears throat> People that actually do something, have a part in what's going on. But it's not critical. They're not leading anyone. They're not going to, you know, run. They're not going to, they're not in charge of five people. They're not going to run people off. Day-to-day sure. Day-to-day things. Yeah. yeah, it's a way to get involved. Are you going to be faithful or are you going to just be here and, you know, we can count on you once in, in a while? Are you going to sign up to be here and then... Not show up <clears throat> two weeks and then come back the next week and say, yeah, Pastor, I'm in, I'm ready, you know, but then not show up the next week. You know, can you be counted on? You know, faithfulness, God honors faithfulness. And so a functional team is a great place for someone to start. So if you're a builder, you're on a building team, you're like, how can we build this ministry? You can use functional people that are just going to... <clears throat> You can plug them in, and that's where you can start discipling them so that they can become a builder. Builders want to find out, okay, how are we going to take this to the next level? Does that make sense? Yeah. So functional teams, building teams, uh, extended teams, advisory teams. If you have a direction with an advisory team, this is the direction we think we should go. What do you think? And they can give you honesty and feedback um, if it's a good direction or not a good direction. And we work together. We are a body, right? It's the body of Christ working together to accomplish His mission, His plans, His idea. That's, <clears throat> that's what we're after, right? Fantastic. This could be, well, this is, this is the most important session I'm going to do, is what we're going to do today.
I think most of you have heard of the seven core competencies that you're looking for in people. The seven core competencies. And, and someone's uh, made a suggestion in our suggestion thing about having slides. That's a great idea. <clears throat> so I'll end up, I'll, uh, I'll do that. Seven core competencies is you want, number one, a sharp strategic mind. Number two, a humble, teachable spirit. Sharp, strategic mind, humble, teachable spirit, em emotional maturity, This one's kind of long. Interpersonal communication skills. Inter. Number four is interpersonal communication skills. So number one is sharp strategic mind. Number two is humble teachable spirit. Number three is integrity, emotional maturity. Number four is interpersonal communication skills. Are we ready for number five? Entrepreneurial instincts. E N T R E We're, uh, we're in the spirit. E-N-T-R-E-P-R-E-N-E-U-R-I-A-L. Instincts. <clears throat> I-N-S. Stinks. Number six, an achiever focused on results. Achiever focused on results. Number seven is really important, the ability to attract other people. So if you have a really sharp person, but they keep running people off, you, you don't want to elevate that guy. Because they'll just keep running people off. So, yeah. <clears throat> I had a greeter one time who was, he had his, he had his finger bit off from a lion because he was training lions. But he, I met him in jail. I said, what happened? He, he was in jail. Well, when he, 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 it was probably a mistake to have him as a greeter, honestly. <laughs> Looking back on it, but he had a good personality, except for when he got mad. And he was, uh, he almost got, a guy took a day off that wasn't supposed to. They were training an elephant. You can't make this up. They were training an elephant. He almost gets killed by the elephant. The next guy, the guy comes to, to, uh, to work. And he stabs him in the chest with a knife and then ends up doing six years in prison because of road rage, because of rage, right? So when I met him, it was years later, he, he was road rage is why he was in jail. And uh, <clears throat> he's greeting one time and we ran out of bulletins. And he said, you have to go. We're out of bulletins. And he wouldn't let the people in the door. I said, why did they leave? He goes, we ran out of bulletins. They can't come in. Yeah, 
you know, something in my direction needed to be a little, a little clearer, I suppose. So whenever we're interviewing, and, and you should always be interviewing, whenever you're meeting somebody, look at these characteristics. Do they have these? Where are they at? And instead of what can you pull out of somebody, what can you put into them? How can you help them grow those characteristics? So everybody can see, everybody can think, and everybody can feel. And that's really what you need. What you, people can see, think, and feel. What do you think about this? What's your thoughts? How would you put this in your own words? What? And you're drawing out the characteristics you want. And, and you can tell easily if, you know, someone has a sharp strategic mind, yet they're not humble and teachable. Now you know where to add value to them. Does that make sense? In, into, uh, into humility. You want sharp people who are interested in the mission. It's tough to build with broken people. And you start with succession in mind. So God doesn't start until he's finished. We start with succession in mind. Where do we need to end up? What is supposed to happen here? What does success look like? Now, succession is, what is success? Ever since the, I first got into really church and Christianity, something has really annoyed me, and that is a ministry will start as long as that guy is doing it, we're good. But if anything ever happened to him, it all falls apart. And I thought, this is wrong. If we're building something, it should be better or at least continue if you're not involved. So succession is who is going to take your spot? Who are you building to take your position? Who could do it? So if God calls you to somewhere else, is there someone right there that can step in and you don't lose a beat? That's succession. You know, the kings, you know, the English kings, they had a succession. One died and then another one took his place. And so we want succession. We want to start with succession. Who is it that I'm supposed to be raising up? That's the first thing we go after. What's the succession here? It's not success that you're wonderful. Everybody knows you're wonderful. And get over that. You know, Jesus Christ thought enough of you to die for you, so good. Right? We're good. <clears throat> we don't, you know, if you want to be patted on the back, see me at the break time, and I'll pat you on the back, and then we can go on. Otherwise, you need to be creating succession or success. If we're not doing that, we're missing it. So take those seven characteristics, and when you're, Talking to somebody, someone comes in, oh, you have this, this, and this. Wow. This is something we can work with. Do you meet anybody like that? Um, there was a... Years ago, I heard this, and it made sense. There was a businessman who was very successful, had... Uh, a good corporation and, th and things were well, but he still felt empty inside. And he knew a person who handed out wheelchairs and that was their ministry, to hand out wheelchairs. And they went to, it was, uh, it wasn't Albania, but it was over there in, in that region. And they went over there to hand out wheelchairs for kids that couldn't get around. He was handing out a wheelchair and he gave one to the, a child and the child stopped and held on to it and stared at him and said stuff in their language the translator translated it 
And it's like, what is he saying? He says, he just wants to remember your face because you've given him this gift that he can get around. Boom. He found a purpose. And he wanted to be really involved in handing out wheelchairs from now on. Those people are everywhere. Uh, the, the man that helps me in the last four years, his name is Lauren. He's a Baptist. He's, they call him Lauren the Baptist. <clears throat> he, he had a seed business for over 30 years in, near Duluth, Minnesota. And the Lord put it on his heart to hire people out of prison. So and if you get out of prison, you have to parole someplace. And so you have to have a job. You have to have these things set up. Otherwise, they don't let you out. So he would go and he would find guys that were in prison and help them out that way. There was nothing wrong with Lauren. You know, Lauren had never been to prison. But that's what the Lord put on his heart. There are people like that in Iowa that have a heart for a ministry, whether it's pregnant mothers or whether it's people in jail, or whether it's someone with cancer, or whether it's someone with this or that, that working with them, because we're building kingdom while we're building life point. So like we said, maybe yesterday, maybe you talk to 100 people, 100 people come through the door, but 25 stay. It's about kingdom business. If you're about kingdom business... And it's surprising what you, how much different you see things. So, <clears throat> we designed and architect a leadership pipeline capable of developing new leaders as fast as possible, based on a relationship, based on our relationships. This is done through teamwork. They won't be able to help you until they are trained and you place them on a team to begin or continue working the process. It's done through relationships. God moves at the speed of relationships. How long does it take? How long does it take to build a relationship? Genuine relationship. How long does that take? Doesn't it vary? Yes. It's kind of like due season. Haven't you wished due season would come and due season doesn't show up until due season shows up? So it's based on a relationship. If we have a relationship, then, then that's how fast we can move. Otherwise, we can't move that fast because there's no trust. There's no, there's no relationship. There's no connection. And so we're stymied by, by not having that connection. So, <clears throat> I'm going to move on from this. If we start with this pipeline, if someone comes on their first visit to LifePoint, what are three things that you can do when they show up? You can welcome them. Yep. What? I said it would be like Dave and love on him, hug on him. I mean, that was love, brother. Not everybody likes that, though. That's why he asks first. Start to get to know them. Let them know that we're in the, in the facilities, okay? We have water, we have coffee, we have restrooms over here. If you'd like to hang your coat up, if there's anything that I can do for you, let me know. So we do... Be sensitive to the spirits. Be yeah. sensitive to the spirit. The spirit will tell you how to... If, they, if they're in a mess, they'll tell you how to pray for them. Or if they need a hug, or if they just need a simple hello. I'm a greeter, so I always ask them... Um, like, I'm like, how are you? You know, how did 
you hear about LifePoint or, oh, are you new? Like, I just usually ask them an open-ended question, and surprisingly, they end up telling you, well, I don't know if I should be here, but... And then I always tell them, I shouldn't be here either, but this is why I'm here. So I always try to, like, just ask questions to see why they're here. And Excellent. it usually is pretty amazing what they say. Excellent. Excellent point. You have to understand where they're coming from. Guard is up. They don't know you. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know the order of things. If you've been there time and time again, I went to a church where they were never expecting anyone to, new to come in, so everybody just did what they did. And, and I was completely ignored while I was there, so it was, it was interesting. <clears throat> but that's why they didn't have anybody. They had like you know 25 people, and that they didn't expect anyone to show up. So do you understand what it feels like to go to a new place, to a new church? I went to a new church, well, 20 years ago when I came to the Lord, I was, went to this new church one Sunday morning and two people said hello. And the next, one of them was a Sunday school gentleman that, that took the agenda or attendance. And the next Sunday morning I went back and that same gentleman introduced himself again and said, glad to meet you, glad you're here. He didn't remember me. <laughs> Well, at least they turned the heat off, huh? <laughs> wasn't attending, talking to the mic. Steve, you should have been here yesterday. Yeah, it was hot. Oh, the mic. Um, but I have, uh, having led that on that side, one of the things I'm always conscious of are, are the greeters or the people expecting other folks to come? Because not everybody expects. Uh, new people to come and when they do are they comfortable receiving them I, I actually <clears throat> this is interesting because somebody here will know what I'm talking about I actually went to a place uh, within the last year and uh, I flew in and my son and I flew so we were dressed to fly we weren't dressed for church so when we got to the church while most of the people in church knew me the person at the door, loving person, didn't know me and was uncomfortable with the way I was dressed. So it was, I had to convince them that it was okay for me to come in and I was Bishop Walter Roberts. Uh, and later on, oh, really you know, right. I now I would never tell the name because they, they were so embarrassed, but they're just a loving person, but it was institutionalized uh, in how they received me. Uh, the dom denominational way of things going and I didn't look like that way. And uh, thank God, I, you know, I didn't because I'm able to see, you know, how, how people, how we look at folks when they come in, you know, you don't think folks can't pick up if, if you got a little bit of issue. And I'm going to stop right there. But anyway. <laughs> Um, being a greeter over years and years and years and years, I've kind of learned a couple different things, and I love it. It's like one of my favorite jobs to do, but one thing I notice that people really like is their name. And if you introduce your name and say, hi, I'm, I'm Christine, you know, what is your name? They get that connection. The other thing is if they have kids, love on their kids. Um, because that will win their heart. That will uh, allow them to say, hey, I really appreciate them because of my kids. Kids are very important, and um, that's what's going to keep the uh, church going and thriving. And so those two, I think, are extremely important. Are these things written down someplace? Where everybody knows them? No. Maybe you ought to try that. touch every person that comes in and I mean so we we go over that in our meetings yes it is written down because you wrote it down in the uh, job description I'm her second so. <laughs> stretch 
Um, the one thing that I noticed when I first came to LifePoint was number one, how the children were received by the members of the church. They felt comfortable and free to run up to anybody was huge to me because the trust of a child is resplendent. And then the second thing was how everybody else treated everybody else. So to me, that's a first impression. I don't get a first impression of a person as they come up to me. I get a first impression of a person as they come up to others because they've known them longer. So that was important to me when I went, went to Life Point. I would suggest you can take that and let everybody know it. So everybody's on the same page. <clears throat> we need to intentionally know what's happening when someone comes in. Oh, well, when they leave, you know, if someone doesn't show up, if you get their phone number, call them. This what happened? What didn't happen? Sometimes it's just not for them. That's okay. So, three things that you can do when they visit. Or, who do you know that needs churching? Hmm. 21 days. How many contacts? What are your three things? You never gave us I don't have them. Oh, okay. You have them. They're your three things. <laughs> In 21 days, how many contacts can you make with a person that just shows up? At least 21. Well, you can call them every day. At least. <laughs> or three or four times a day. Or three or four times a day. <laughs> and won't be back. <laughs> well, if they come to church three days a week, or three days a week, if they come to church three times each week, you know, once a week, that's three. So they come into church, what else? But I would contend that if they come to church three times a week and they just came, then that's not going to be hard. Right. I mean, what I meant was once a week for three weeks in a row, 21 days. I know. Okay. Well, all right. But I, was just, I was interpreting what you said. They're going to come to service throughout the week. Then if you have a midweek service, that's two more. Or, or a group, that's two more. What, what helps people build relationships is connection and contact. So the more opportunities we have for a natural contact, the, the more likely we are to build a relationship. Is there a, a, like a 30-day plan when someone comes in? When someone graces the door, what should happen within the first month? Yeah, we have, a, we have done follow-up. It's kind of been sketchy from time to time, but there's there. We have had... We've tried different things. Like currently, I think we're trying to get an email sent out to them right after they have visited. And uh, in the past, we've sent handwritten notes. And it's time to time it's happened and not happened. Yes. Yeah, so I just want to um, add on to what uh, Elder Janice had stated. Um, you know, there's been times when we've dropped the ball. And 
I believe now we are getting to the point where we're uh, getting things solidified and we're consistent. So now we've got the pastor's greetings, which I think is an excellent idea. Uh, once people come in, it's the pastor's uh, sending out a video message first for the first time guest that welcomes them. And then as you know, uh, some of the others that said home point now, which is an excellent um, additive that we are able to provide to people because other than that, we're just really down to one day out of the week, you know, before home point. And so that's been for a while. So it's just nice to have something that we can say, hey, you know, we've got these home point services we can invite you to as well. So how long is it from when someone walks through the door to when they can serve? when they can do something. Say that again. So how long is it if someone comes in the first day and then till they're able to serve? What's the pathway for that? So typically what we do right now is is uh, they can it's it's kind of uh, loose right now because what we what we would like for them to do is uh, become a partner. Uh, before they decide to to serve in the department, uh, and currently we hold partnership uh, about twice a year, uh, usually in January, in July, or June and July, that that kind of area. So we just had a partnership class now, and so those people that have just uh, decided to become a partner will decide where they want to serve, and we'll try and get them plugged in. Um, uh, I think maybe maybe something we might have to consider is, is doing it more often, but without a building, we we, we do it out of currently the pastor's home. So and there's a challenge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so we just have to figure a work around to wait to get more people involved because we obviously we have more people, new partner or potential new partners that, that show up, uh, in between classes that, that, you know, that may not stick around for that long if, if they're not plugged in right they away. They even might go through the whole partnership class and then leave. Yeah. yeah that's true too. Yeah. <laughs> that definitely happen. That might even happen. Yeah, but that's what we that's what we have right now, uh, as far as is getting people plugged into to departments and and volunteering. So how many people would have to go through? I'm just asking questions. So how many people have to go through the the partnership class before we can add 25 to the congregation? 25 people. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a lot higher than that. So maybe one of the reasons that we're not adding is we're not moving that fast enough intentionally. From a <laughs> pastoral side, um, the process has always been, since we've been here, that anybody that signs up for partnership and, and it doesn't matter whether they've been here a week two weeks five years from the moment they sign up they are eligible to serve isn't that right elt mm -hmm. is that the first time you're hearing that no. okay you're not saying that who said heard it for five years thank you <laughs> so that's the process so what that does is it prevents since we only have um every six months new partnership classes gives them the opportunity to acclimate, see if they want to fit in, but they're not prevented from serving. But they must be accountable to the team leader, and they must be willing to sign up. And even if they drop, they drop. That's fine. But it gives them an opportunity to serve while they're here, while they're experiencing life point. Occasionally, we have people that come in the door, and it just coincides with, with a class that's coming up. Isn't that right, ELT? Okay. I just want to make sure. And so with that being said, then they come through the process, and we've got a series of classes that we ask them to go through to help disciple them, to learn where they're at spiritually and put them on a place of success. And then they join teams and so on and so forth. So, you have anything to add, Steve? In the, in the church culture and also I 
believe this is the same thing in the secular culture, which is why I believe that we have an incredible amount of problems that we have in both sides. Everybody thinks that somebody else is going to do that. You know, when you're at work and you, I used to run, I used to run 63 restaurants and one of the things that we had to train all of our managers was don't walk by it. If you're walking through the parking lot and there's trash in the parking lot, you stop and pick up the trash in the parking lot and then remind the people that are in charge of that, that there was some trash in the parking lot. You might need to do that. And I think in the kingdom, we do that all the time. And we even make it really, really divine. Because the Holy Spirit's going to do that. <laughs> Jesus will do that. And so then we take all culpability, we take all responsibility off of it, we take all of the legitimate parts of the gospel, which is go ye into all the world. Because somebody else is going to do that. You, there's not a single person in here that doesn't have the ability or the grace of God for a visitor to come in for you to literally wreck them with the power of God to prophesy to them to love them to find out what's going on in their life that drew them there in the first place to find out what the needs are to, there's not one single person that's not the greeter's job it's not the usher's job and dear Jesus it's not the pastor's job and until we all embrace the fact that every one of us has the same nature and ability of Christ on the inside of us to accomplish what we're called to accomplish, we're going to continue with this finger pointing that somebody else is responsible for that and nobody else is going to do it. And we're going to say, well, they just didn't like our church and so they left. Can I add to that? One of the things that uh, when I, <laughs> thank you. one of the things I learned in the military, um, I remember my first duty station in uh, Germany, Frankfurt, Germany, and uh, they had what they called a FOD walk, foreign object damage. And what they would do is they would take, it didn't matter who you were, it didn't matter if you were a full bird colonel to a lowly airman, private equivalent. Everybody had to take the turn of stretching a crowd, uh, across the, the full runway and just walk, everybody. So the rank structure did not matter. And what it did is it built camaraderie because what they were endeavoring to do was not just let the, the, the elites or the high-ranking officers watch this, the lowly peons do the work because it, it, it humanizes the event. And what we're after is we're looking for even the tiniest screw, a rivet that could get caught in an engine, that could get sucked into that engine, do damage, and cause the whole thing to crash, an airplane to crash. And I think, to Steve's point, what we do is we're, we're so, we've been taught so much delegation many times that we forget that we have all come the same, the same pipeline. We started at the beginning. So we can't think higher of ourselves than we ought to, is what the scripture said. We simply look, if, like he said, trash on the floor, pick it up, you know, and keep walking. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. And I think that culture's been uh, perpetuated, you know, in the church. Somebody else should, I'm an elder now. I'm a pastor now. If I see trash, I pick it up. Big deal. If I see somebody at the door, hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm Tommy. I, you know, and that's just my policy. I don't have to be Pastor Tommy. I am that. But I'm Tommy. And so that, that individualization is what causes people to take you as a real person and not just as a life point person or church person. So. Going back to where I said that the one church I walked into and only two people had greeted me. Before that, months before that, God had, was placing on my heart to get involved in a church, to get to know, well, actually to get to know him. And I had gone to a mainline church for like four or five months. People were nice, people were friendly, but there was something missing and I didn't know what. Tried some other churches out, and then I walked into this church. The people totally, practically ignored me. Not this one? No, not this one. This was 25 that. years ago. But when the worship started, and I didn't know what it was at the time or who it was at the time, but the Holy Spirit was talking to me, and he said, this is your home. This is where I want you to be. In a place that didn't greet me at all, that's where God put me, in a Pentecostal church. That's the first thing. The second thing, and I'm not going to name names, but there is a friend of mine 
who went away to college 30 years ago, left a loving family. She decided to go a long ways away. She went down to Texas, looked for a church. She came from a mainline denomination up here. She looked for a church in Texas. She walked into this bigger, beautiful-looking church, was greeted by this nice-looking middle-aged woman, started up a friendship with her. She had no friends down there, this, this friend of mine. This greeter turned out to be from a satanic cult and got her involved in rituals and drug addiction and some other stuff. So I guess that's one of the reasons I'm one of the ones that say, you know what? A new person walks in, let's love on them, let's lead them to the Lord if need be, let's help them whichever way God tells us to, but I don't want them on the front door for a while until you really get to know them. So again, you know, Pastor Randy was saying um, about the, the time and, 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 you know, as Reverend Robin said, what I have found is you know, people need that time. You know, everybody does everything differently, um, but many times people will go to a church, and I've gone to churches where that day, no judgment here, but they'll say, anybody want to join the church? They just came in, you know. Um, let's, again, so the, the process that, you know, our pastors have set up, I appreciate it. When I came in, uh, some traumatic things happened in my life. So, you know, I was glad that I didn't have that pressure. Of, oh, well, come on in. Join the church. And so I wasn't, when I came this church, I wasn't ready to, oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll join. No, it was just some time <laughs> to uh, breathe everything that had happened. So... You know, everybody does things differently, but um, I feel extremely blessed in the processes that we have going on here and, you know, allowing people that time. So he and I, I got one myself. So he and I were talking, I remember, <clears throat> he and I were talking about what, how are we going to open up this pipeline? Because that's what we need to do. We need to add more. We need to be in contact with more people in the outside world, outside of the doors of the church, in order to have them to the service to be part of the work of the ministry that we're doing, whether whether it's on Sunday morning or not. You know, what is the work of the ministry that you're doing? What's the work of the ministry that you're doing? <clears throat> Where, where are you doing this? How? What is your assignment? Does everybody know what their assignment is from God? What's, what's he assigned you to do? When, you, when we have an assignment, it's really doggone difficult to get out of it. <sighs> so, <clears throat> y'all have, uh, Ricky, Antoinette, y'all have been listening. What are your thoughts? <laughs> She, she does the talk, and that's what he said. No, no, she, no I don't like to talk. So she oh, she doesn't talk. like to talk. <laughs> um, there's a lot to be said about what to do when visitors come in. Um, we had an experience. We went on vacation to Daytona Beach. First of all, we were looking for a church to go to, so we went on the internet. Um, we looked at churches trying to get a name, you know, something that would strike out, stick out to us. So we found a church. Uh, we went to the church. We got there and we parked outside. We stayed in the car for like seven, eight minutes, just nervous about going into the church. Um, it says apostle in front of your name, Ricky. I mean, and you were nervous to go into the church? Yes, because we were a visitor. The apostle was nervous to go into the church. And we sat there for a minute. We went in, finally got ourselves together. My wife went in. 
um, the, no one greeted us. No one greeted us. No one said hi or where to, sit. Or where to sit. So we went in. We sat in the back of the church. Um, worship was wonderful. My wife started crying. Um, she looked around. No one was attentive. No one came and gave her tissue or hand or anything. Oh. And so she had to you go to the bathroom right <laughs> to go get her own tissue. Um, yes, he gave, he gave her a paper towel. Paper <laughs> towel. <laughs> uh, they allowed us. They, they allowed me to say some things after service, and I said what I I told the congregation our experience. And then we had the opportunity to go to the go out to eat with the pastor and his wife the next day. Had a chance to sit down and explain to him what our experience was. That helped me as a pastor. Uh, to understand what visitors go through even before they get in the door. So it's important that we um, kind of calm their nerves and, and greet them lovingly and not be so overbearing because you don't know what someone is coming into the church carrying. Um, we just need to be real and just, I agree, have a system in place to greet and to follow up, not to be overbearing because, again, um, we can run people away as far as that. Um, I like something you uh, reference to saying everyone should be welcoming because that's that's the point. Everything speaks from them walking up to the church, the parking lot, is their parking lot attendant, someone greeting them when they come in the door, someone greeting them when they walk into the sanctuary and when they sit down next to you, if you're there, say hello to them because again, you're fearful, you're a visitor, your first time there, you don't know the culture, you don't know the people, but everything speaks and we have seven touches. That's the parking lot attendant, the greeter, the usher, the postcard, the follow up. Say it again. Seven touches. Seven, seven touches. touches. Yes. What is that? It say depends it on the ministry, but for us, it's the parking lot attendant, the greeter, the usher, when they sit down next to you, the welcome and the reception afterwards to greet them and then the follow-up call maybe eight and then the, the postcard touches. that goes out the day after so it's seven touches it's a follow-up and everybody knows about that we try to express that and even after service so many times we try to get to one another and the visitor is just there like walking out of the door alone no one's saying glad you were here Please come back again. So we tried it the last three, the put a timer up three minutes at the end of service saying, go to the visitor. And after the three minutes, then greet one another. She wants to have it. I had an experience where I took my sister to a church in Des Moines, and it was a Christian faith church. I hope and, so. <laughs> what? It was a Christian based church? A Christ, it was called Christian. It was very similar to what our church name was. Okay. So I felt like we should go to that one. Um, we we arrived late, and so we kind of did have to just sneak through the back. And we had uh, my daughter and her kids with her. And there were um, apparently some elders in the church sitting right behind us. They had like, that's where they sat. And so as soon as uh -oh. we got up, and we're ready to leave. Of course, my sister's ready just to slide out. And these elders were like, hey, um, are you guys new here? And so apparently, they told us they always sit there. That's kind of one of their spots. Um, and I thought it was interesting because they could see everything. So those elders said, you know, would we be able to take you guys out to lunch? So I was just really impressed because I love my LifePoint family. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything bad about the way I was taken care of when I came here because I felt really humbled and like I was pulled in like a family. But I thought it was incredible that there was somebody there to say, those are new, we need to grab them. And they introduced us to every, diff well, not every different sector, but my sister was able to meet the uh, child care ministry and they introduced her to the pastor got her a few phone numbers and so when i left her in des moines she had contact and they took us out to eat like they promised they would um and so i just thought that was really powerful like what if it had nothing to do with church it was like 
just in, inviting them to meet the people that they needed to know. And there was no, like, you have to do this. You have to come back. It was just, um, I just thought that was really, really cool. Like, um, you know, um, I think of like Mike and Mary Lou, like, as, um, you know, just like certain people like that who they are very aware and, and I look up to them. Like if I was new, if they had come up to me and my children and said, could we take you out for ice cream or something like just simple like that, an act of what's next when they leave out the door. Um, so I thought that was cool. Um, and just kind of pivoting off of what she was saying that they don't just walk out the door and feel like they were unnoticed because then it just falls off the minute they leave. Good. Yep. Okay. I didn't, want to break I'd intercept you if, <laughs> if it was not good. Okay. Uh, so I've been doing this 50 years uh, in the church and watched this process from a child up. And one of the things I want to make sure people are aware of that sitting here doesn't make me aware of, t time changes things. The, pro the methodology changes. Mm -hmm. The message doesn't, but the methodology has changed. This right here is a testament to the methodology changing. Um, the awareness of Pastor Tommy and his connections that he got through his relationship with God has, has made the connections with you and Pastor Steve and yes, Pastor, Steve, uh, uh, Pastor Castle, Pastor <laughs> Winters. All these things have, have, yeah. have led to this moment, this time, which allows God to bring the giftings out of you to help grow this, this ministry and any others that you come in contact with. But it wasn't always that way. I, our church grew from five to 300 before my failings, <coughs> my life, and God's plan for me caused it to say that was it. It began to change. But in our growth, we didn't do as much follow-up. We didn't do all these principles. What we did was serve God. What we did was seek God. And we, I wouldn't even open the doors of the church because my thing, my faith was we're going in after God. If you want to join us, then you choose to. And what happened was people would say to members, that, you know, they'd be visiting for a long, they visiting for a long time, and say, "Do you all ever open the doors of the church? Can anybody join this church?" And they say, "Sure. How do you think we got this big? People join." They said, "Well, how do I join?" And then an elder would come to me and say, uh, "Bishop, we well, got, you know, some folks here who want to join the church." And I'm like, "Okay, well, come on, let's." Let's talk. Let's do it. And, they, and we'd meet them and talk to them. And, and uh, they'd ask to join. They'd go through new members class before we would accept them. And then we'd have a celebration about, hey, we've got some new folks that have come through the new members class. We've got them. My point in all that is I was, I was listening to each one talk about, well, we got these touches and, and, and their experience going into the church and, and, and the pipeline. I'm like, isn't it amazing that you know, the, the processes that we're learning are about increasing our method, increasing our tools to reach people in this day. Because we didn't always have the tools, we weren't always knowledgeable of the tools. I would say tools probably were. And, and the end of that is not every big church grows because people necessarily are looking for God. Some churches grow because it's where the elite go. It's, it's where businessmen go. It's where all the Baptists go, excuse me, you know, in that regard. But, you know, I've, I've been exposed and participating in different reformations, and they all have different reasons for why people go there. So if we know why, you know, uh, I'll say this and get this back to you, but Otis Lockett was a great man of God and grew many churches and planted many churches in Greensboro in that region of North Carolina. And one of the things he asked me years ago was says, why should people come to your church? If you don't know why people should come to your church, it doesn't make you any different than anybody else. They can choose whatever. Well, why should they come to yours? So. We'll do this for. Uh... I was just saying, you have that mic. Oh, I thought you wanted to say something. 
say something. <laughs> so, to try to um, go off what you were just talking about, you know, the tools to, we were talking about, like, to grow in any aspect. Um, I think these days, um, sometimes we, I, going off that 21 day, how can you get people and things of that nature? I used to work with a company and I used to have to be in charge of getting new people in, you know, growing um, a company. And at first I was never really good at talking to people. You know, I was like, I don't know really how to do this. I don't know how I'm gonna have people come and grow in any aspect. And so I actually had to take the time to really sit down and one word had came up to me and it was like networking. You know, I, and I never had heard that word before, like networking and really how do you network? What strategies do you have to a possess to network and as well as what do you have to do after you start networking? You know, and I had to break it down. And I think this can apply to like any aspect in your life, you know, and especially with organizations. And I would just say, start by like your personal people. You know, when you think about where can I grow as one person can bring in five people. You know, at first I didn't have any clientele, but then I looked over a year and I had a hundred people. And then I was like the top of my class, you know, with getting, you know, the most people. I was like, wow, I didn't know I can even possess that. And so sometimes you, you have to kind of be bold and not scared, even in your everyday life, not to talk to a, a new person or a person, a family member or a friend and things of that nature and say, hey, I want to network with you in this aspect. And so sometimes it just has to like, you have to open up a little bit. And if you know you're a person who it, it's hard to open up, just say, it's hard for me to open up. Sometimes that's just usually how I used to have to talk to people. Hey, it's hard for me to open up, but I have a, a purpose to talk to you today. I have a reason to talk to you and can you meet with me and things of that nature. And when I'm sitting here today, I'm like, this is a perfect thing for a church environment, you know, to learn how to network using that word and like breaking it down in your own way and seeing how you can flourish. That's all I have to say. So if we are purposeful and intentional about what we're doing, we probably will get a greater result. What we're doing here, what just happened was common sense. Applying common sense. Everybody has an opportunity to contribute. Everyone's voice is important. <clears throat> Whether Whatever we think about it, everyone's voice is important. Everybody gets an opportunity to, to be a part of, intentionally. Opportunity. What we want to do, you know, we want what? Work. We want to work together. And we want to win. Right? Isn't that fantastic? All right. <clears throat> Do you have what? You want to read Nehemiah? Wow. I just want to read some. Is that okay? Yeah, nice. <laughs> You gotta turn your cell phone. <laughs> they, the common body of believers in Jerusalem, the common body of believers at Life Point, they, you're all here. 
the faithful ones, the ones that come out on a Saturday morning in the cold, and you're here. Warming up. Not so much in this room. Not so much. They continued steadfastly, diligently, faithfully, reliably, with punctuality, under the pastor's teaching. They steadfastly came willingly to the pastor's teaching. They willingly, steadfastly fellowshiped in meals and conversation with each other. They united in relationship and in knowledge of each other, loving on each other, caring for one another, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So here we have some ingredients. You attend church faithfully. You hear what the word of man of God has for the word of God for you today and in season. You fellowship with each other, take each other out to eat, meet for coffee, become best of friends, get to know each other, and pray. There's three ingredients right there for richness in the church. Reverence and respect came to every soul. Many signs and wonders were done through the leadership. You guys have at least eight in leadership. All of you are assigned to signs and wonders, let alone that every believer is called to do greater works than these. All who believed were gathered together and had all things in common. There's no judgment there. They sold their property and goods and distributed them to all according to their need. And commune, continuing daily with one mind in the temple and breaking bed from house to house, they ate their food with gladness. They were content. How much have we heard about contentment this weekend? They were content. Breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and with simplicity of heart. Simplicity. They were in a mode of rest. Simplicity. They got the clutter out of their lives. They parked media for a while. The phone didn't come out when they were trying to have fellowship and breaking bread. They were listening intently as for the first time, even though they'd been together for how long? Amen? Do you see how all this is coming together to a head today? They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, knowing who to give credit to, having favor with the people. Now all of a sudden we've switched from just the believers in the church to all the people. We all of a sudden just went outside our front doors. You see that? Because of your unity, favor with all the people went out the front doors, down through the 380 corridor. And the Lord added to the church daily. Do you see how all of this that we're talking about comes to rest into this very room? Not everybody is here. We don't have all of LifePoint attending here this weekend. The faithful, the leadership, those that are behind this man and Lynette are here. You guys are called out. You've got priorities straight. There might be some priorities you can minister to for others. But this is LifePoint. Yesterday, the Lord spoke a word over all of you. He said, there's greatness in this room. Do you know where your greatness is going to come from? From this, what I just read. Your fellowship, your unity, your prayers, the breaking of bread with each other, not judging one another, not trying to compete, but being in one mind, under fellowship of your shepherd, and working together. And the Lord's favor will go down the I-380 corridor and you put to practice the things you're hearing there this weekend. Oh, 250 is such a low number. 250 is such a low number. Huh. Amen? That's Acts chapter 2. I am... That's Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. Thank you, Randy. I'm done. <laughs> <clears throat> well, what we're going to do now is play another, uh, another game. You only get to play this game once in your whole life. Because after you play it once... You don't want to play it again. <laughs> no, uh, you get to play it once. It's called the Red Black Game. Has anyone played the Red Black Game? Because if you did, you can't play it. Because if you did, 
Well, here's how the game works. We want to work together and we want to win. Okay? That's, that's the rules of the game, like the game at my recovery home. Uh, don't have sex with one another and don't use drugs. That's kind of my rules, so I like to keep it very simple. All right? So we're going to start out and we're going to go, we're going to name off, we're going to go number one, number two, number one, number two. All right, so first we're going to do that. We're going to get into two groups. Number one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, 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 so there, now we got the groups. What group are you in? Two. You're in group one or two. <clears throat> and so there is a couple other rules. One is, what, what number are you, she? She's number one, one. Janita. Janita, you're number one. Hey. A number one. A number one. All right, so everyone in your group, does it, do we know what a caucus is yes. Iowa? We should know what a caucus is, right? What what's a caucus? What? Go gather, represent, come together, muse, talk about, reason out, right? So we're gonna caucus within your group and then everyone gets a vote in your group so everyone gets to vote all right and then once you make a choice then we're going to write down the choice and that's the rules it's pretty 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 simple so group one gets to stay here group two is going to come with me outside so if you're in group two, come with me outside. I need someone to uh, grab the paper. One, stay here. And yeah, just, just uh, if you're a one, stay here. If you're a two, come with us outside, out here. There's one's. Number two's out here. And you can maybe pick that table or somewhere. And what I need you to do is caucus about it and then vote. Caucus about it and vote. Then you want to vote what is red. You want to vote red or black. Okay. So you caucus about it, and then you vote red or black. Now I gotta go tell them. So did you hear all that? Yeah. So, about it, and vote red or black. Okay. So you probably need to get up and come together. Uh, I don't. Know, you might want to put this somewhere. You need a caucus about it, and in number one, you want to vote red or black. Uh, I'll put it here, and then you guys caucus about this and vote.
Can, I turn this back on without uh, eek, eek. So, wasn't that fun? Yes, that was a great time. I'm so glad we had to share that time with us. So, <clears throat> we voted. We voted. We did. We voted. That was great. All right. So, let's let's look at this here. So we got red, black. We got red, black. So oh, red plus five, right? And then red, black, red, black. Minus five. Minus five. And then red, red. Would be negative, negative, negative three, negative three, and then red black would be red plus five, five, and then uh, negative five. Gee, boy, I don't know what. Negative five, and then well, let's times this by two, and then number four. <coughs> Red, red is negative three, negative three, right? And then, and then this would be, there's a pattern here, plus five, and then, and then negative five, five right there, and then red, red, oh, look at this, was, it's like a system, and it's plus five, five, and guess what? That's negative five. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, five, okay. Now, all right. <clears throat> Isn't this fabulous? So let's add this up. All right, so I have plus five and negative five, which would be zero. Now let's add these up first. So plus five and negative three is what? Two plus five, seven. seven. Wait, times two. All right, well, we won't do the times two. Negative, Arbitrary. negative three, four, four. four. plus five, nine, nine. nine. six, six. six. Eleven. eleven. They scored. Score. All right. So negative <laughs> five is negative five. Yep. Plus negative three, negative eight, negative, eight. negative five. 29. What? Negative 13. Negative 16. Negative 16. Negative 21. Negative 21. Negative 24. Negative 29. Negative 29. So 11 plus negative 29 is what? Negative 18. What? So, okay, so why did you only put negative numbers when there were black numbers on the table? That's the code. But these are all black. Okay, well, you're talking about group two. You're talking about group two. Yeah. Okay, group two. On the first black one, you put negative five instead of positive three. Why? Where? Right there. Why did we go negative instead of positive? Why can't we have? Why wasn't it positive three in that? Group? Red, black. Red, black. Red, black. You chose red. Group one chose red. Group two chose black. 
That's black. Negative. What? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, may I, may I also so, take so, a look? I'm going to ask this question. Forgive me for stepping up. You got red and you put plus five. Where'd you get that plus five from? Right there. Group right here. One. Right there. Right? Group one votes red. Group one picked group... red. Plus five. Yes. Right, okay. Yeah. Group two picked black. In our first one, why do we... No, no, no. It's red, black. So that should be zero. So this is the key. Because it says red-black. So, so, so we have to go down here. If the combination is red-black, then the combination is red-black. I'm staying out of this. That's fine. That's zero, not negative five. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not perceiving. But see, see, we're interpreting it differently. Yes. So we're interpreting it differently. Yeah. Yeah. This is the key. Okay, but the key is, from our standpoint, as group two, we can pick, we can pick whatever number here. So if we, as group two, pick this first one right here, why why doesn't a positive three go here? Why does it have to be a negative five? Because it has to be. <laughs> Who told you that? So we should have determined that based on what? He didn't tell us that. He's the ball. But he didn't tell us that. No, he didn't. He gave you different information than he gave us. Right, he didn't tell us. No, he didn't give us any information. But, but, but again, so how are you coming up with the sequence? He came up with the It's arbitrary. But it's arbitrary. Isn't it subjective? Hey, 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 hey. It's his game. I get it. But, but, it's his game without full information. This is, this is so, what happens when... When our number is better than yours, <laughs> but your number is not better than mine. <laughs> so actually, it would have came out on the positive side if each and every one of us chose black for everything. In other words, it would have been three, 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 three. But we didn't know the rules of the game. And group two voted correctly. Then I don't care for red though. If I don't care for red, <laughs> then I'm gonna navigate or gravitate to black. That's just the way it is. Thank God you didn't use white black. <laughs> it looks like the one rule that is in play here is that group one determines everything for group two. Whoever chose first chooses. Either, either team could have chose first. They just happened to pick first. So that's an excuse. You did. You listen, came out. Listen now. Let, let's just listen for a second. I like the discussion. What this game shows is how you do life. What it, what it is, is red... Black. So if team group one chooses red, it goes across to black. That's the way it works. That's the game. Whether you like it or not, that's the way it is. Whether you think it should be different or not, that's the way it is. And it's caused us to lose. <clears throat> so, if we, so, 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 so if we have chosen, if we had chosen first, if we had chosen black, we would have gotten plus three first, and then they would have gotten uh, across plus, plus three. Correct? Or yes. they would have gotten negative five. Because they chose second. So, they would have so gotten the top two was, the top two were for, reserved for the who chose first, right? If everybody would have chose black, no matter what, it would have been plus six all the way across, top score 35. Okay. Or seven times six. Forty-two. Forty-two would have been forty-two. See, the reason why we chose uh, red was because the numbers were more, more positive than black, negative two. So that's why we looked red all the way across. Some people chose numbers because they didn't know what was going on. Yeah. I said red is well. We had no idea of factors or direction, so why not just make one plain choice? There's going to be outcome regardless. So why not just make one choice and stick with it? Without direction, we didn't know the correct direction Punch. to take. So it's the directions, folks. I didn't get good directions, so I'm... Yeah. It's your fault. You came up with a game. <laughs> <laughs> it's my game, and I'll take it's that preacher God gave us. <laughs> I have not to carry any fault because we made a 
choice and we live with it. Yeah. Yeah, we rolled the dice. All of us made that choice. <coughs> based on well, all of us here made that choice based on what we decided he was gonna do. And I refuse to get in the confusion. <laughs> so let's go. Make the choice and go with it. Chaos, chaos produces chaos. You did not give us clear directions, so we weren't clear in what we were doing. So that's that. So it's my fault? <laughs> no, we didn't say that. That's what I said. <laughs> okay, here, here's something. There is never going to be a scenario where you go in and where you're pioneering or you're starting to do something, or you're stepping out in faith where you're going to get all the answers. And it's not going to be clearly defined. And you need to have God in order to define what was going on. What did I say you needed to do before we stopped, before we started? We needed to work together. Mm -hmm. Oh, not just as one, within one group. We needed to work together with both groups combined, basically. And so we were supposed to be running out the door? No. 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 Why didn't you go out the door and get them and bring them back in? Because we assumed. You yeah. took them out. We assume, You're in charge yeah. of this we exercise. That there was a <clears throat> we didn't run and touch the wall, guys. Yeah. <laughs> what did we learn about that the first day? Right? Mm -hmm. Just go touch the wall. Mm -hmm. It is to work together. Obviously, this is a game that sets people up. <laughs> Obviously, that's the truth. However, it, 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 it sheds light on how we operate and how we do things. The, this group in here says, red, 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 positive, 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 we're going to win. We don't care about them out there. That's what I came in here and heard. There's no way we can lose. <clears throat> you, didn't, you, didn't allow us to be, you didn't tell us to be one in the game. Yeah, I mean, we're taking instructions in an exercise. We're doing an exercise you create. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the fact of what he said, it's what he didn't say. That's the thing to it, too. It was the fact of what he didn't it's, give us many parameters, so we were free to go outside of those parameters and we didn't realize it. So let's put this into a spiritual sense then. If God gives us a vision and a goal, how are we going to get there? Work together. That's what I've been talking about for two days. Yeah. Teamwork. So we follow the rules of man because you told us, you, you split us into two. Man's rules. And you gave the parameters. I didn't split you at all. All I said was group two, come out here. That's not splitting. No, no. Actually, actually, it's not. Actually, it's not, if I can say this. Actually, you know, the fact that he wrote on here, work together to win, and the whole concept of all of this speaks to our mindset, each one was right. mine included, okay, when we, because our world is competitive, and there's competitive people. I'm chief of that. Okay, I always want to win. I admit that openly. But the reality of it is, is that we automatically separated ourselves because he, he invited us or escorted us out of the room. We did not have to stick with that. But because we thought we were competing against each other. And churches do it all the time. Right. And that's his point. It's a great point. That's why we only play at one time. But so when we got out, and I don't know what you guys did. When we got out here, we started finding it makes no sense. We started coming. I was chief of that, coming up with all these different reasons why we can't, you can't win this. You could win it. Regardless of, you know, of the number total there, if we had, any one of us had taken the moment and said, you know what, let's go see what they're doing. But we, we were thinking competitively instead of unified. You know, so the directions were what they were, which were vague. That's fine. I've but had, the object is to work. Together. I've had people sneak into the room and then the people in the room they snuck into chased them out. So, <laughs> so, I, have a, so I have a I'm asking for an analysis of me. What makes me different? That I, I just wouldn't be. I say like, I'm not getting involved in the confusion. I, I am in this this workshop, this these sessions to receive from you all leading. Not that I can't go somewhere and hear God for me, but I'm submitting myself to you. And in submitting myself to you, you said number off, one, two, one, two, and two. So we're ones and then twos, and you said twos come out here, ones here, caucus, and vote. Yep. And in the process, there were no instructions as to what happened from there. So we submitted to Pastor Steve, who said, red. I said, amen. Let's just not do the confusion. We, it's okay to be red. 
So I'm wondering if, if he felt competitive, that's my brother, if he felt that he was competing to win, I didn't feel that because I was like, all this is you running back and forth and all this going on creates confusion for me. That's and a, I won't, I'm that, not participating in confusion. That's, so, so why am I it, different it, instead of being competitive? It, it's, it's on purpose to create the confusion, to create pressure, to make a decision. We shouldn't be making decisions because of pressure. We should be making decisions because we all agree. Now, what happened? What what happens sometimes is someone will step up and they'll say, "Hey, I got this," and because of who they are as a leader, everyone else's voice is turned down, and they don't have the same voice, and so their personality comes out and says, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna defer and and, and we'll go take go along your ride." Now, what is that gonna cost? just going along with somebody else. <clears throat> in this setting, it costs, it, it costs me not being in the, what the, the noise. In this setting. And that's all I was dealing with, was the, this setting. I just don't do that. So that, that. so that was my choice. But he said your personality comes out. So my choice was not to be, my personality is not to be, not to choose the confusion. I perceived it as confusion. So you said, I'm going to step away. I'll step away from the confusion and wait till it calms down. Then we, you know, but then your voice wasn't important. Your my voice, voice was important, but not... What I, what, what I did voice. say, now you told me that my, my, rules are, my rules were vague, but what I did say is everybody gets to vote. Yeah. And, and, I and, and, wow. and to caucus together. That means dominant personalities need to listen to undominant personalities. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, the same the same thing happens in you know from a from a leadership perspective. We've got we've gotten in the habit, and I'm just speaking for myself here, you know, where we we do a, a community think, but usually it's steered by one or two people. And and my my I asked Pastor Steve before this exercise kicked off a few minutes ago. I asked him this question when we were talking about I don't know what we were talking about the aspect. Do are there people that come and dominate your time after service? Right? It ha does it happen? Oh yeah. Okay. And and with that illustration, I'm thinking to myself, I want everybody in the in the room, even the least voice like like Janita, you know, I want that I want that least voice to have as much input as mine. I need it. I need it. So if I, if I personally avoid the confusion, that might be exactly what I need and allow that confusion because ultimately we're all believers. We all have the same objective and we can minimize the noise of the confusion and maybe we can get an answer out of this that actually helps the entire group. If that, that's just my perspective on it. So I'm just looking at it from that standpoint. Everybody that has a say-so, and, and it speaks to people not sitting back and just not saying anything. Everybody has something to say. Everybody should have something to say. Okay. Um, there's a, I, I write things down so I don't forget. And then otherwise, if I got the mic and then I didn't write down, I, would, I wouldn't be able to say what I had to say. So I know before, I'll, I'll speak to LifePoint when I used to be here. So when we went over the vision, there had to be clarification, there had to be goals written down. And if, if there was any confusion or, or whatever, that's when we had the time to ask questions. So if there's a couple people in the group who feel like, I don't want to get involved with that confusion, we have what's called a parking space. And you write it down on little stickies, you ask your questions, you write down your comments, put it in the middle in the parking space. Though that is for a lot of people that don't have a voice or feel they don't have a voice. And then after you discussed one topic, you take a look what's in your parking space and you, you directly answer those questions in your parking space so that everybody has that voice and those questions can be answered in clarification or whatever the case may be or whatever your, top, your topic is um, for that, that specific time, whether it be the vision or it be a mission or a goals that you're trying to attain. And it kind of takes all that confusion and um, misunderstanding and it, it puts clarification to whatever you're trying to get across. Just a minute. Right. <laughs> <laughs>
Now I can talk. <clears throat> this lesson also brings up another valid point, very good point. And that is, I'm standing up here. We're about to take a picture. We take the photo. And Randy leans over into my ear and says, we're going to play a little game. You know what that does to me? Game, bring on. Let's go. I heard it through these. I heard it through the lens. So we all have triggers. We all have triggers. We all have things that what see or what we see somebody's all's action triggers something inside of us and all of a sudden they're a winner or they're a loser. I heard the word game. My filter said, let's go. So yeah, when we got going here, it's like, okay, they're out there. Bring them back in here. Watch this. We got some math going on in here <laughs> and figures out we got a winning category here, winning column. Let's win the game. Filters, lenses. Table. So, so we felt the, no, I'm serious. So, so we felt the pressure of that and in needing to make decisions, people aren't saying anything. Like you said, dominant personality is going to step to the top, you know, so it, it needs to be a collaborative effort, you know, and, and to Christine's point, that's what teams are for. You know what I mean? That's why decisions are not made just, you know, at the CEO level. All that information has to also be disseminated and climbed, you know, however it goes back and forth, drill down or whatever the case is. So, yeah, it, it's a good question. But at some point, you've got to face the reality of constraints. And if you make those decisions under pressure, you're going to make the wrong decision. You've got to go be led by the Spirit of God. You've got to pause and take a step back. I think one thing that happens a lot on teams is that people have – they come to the table with their ideas and they come to the, sometimes people get really passionate about something they want to see happen. That's kind of like what Pastor Tommy was saying. And so it can be hard then like all of the air kind of gets sucked up, you know, and you kind of have to really learn how to manage, you know, to get people to number one, see the big picture, but also um, you have to be able to get people to talk to each other and say, okay, you know, each person has, they're bringing their gifts and they're bringing their ideas and they all have a contribution. And if you can get them talking to each other, hopefully <laughs> you can get, make some progress and you can kind of. Yeah. Yeah. else to do all right <clears throat> how do you think you did personally how did you play the game personally tj how did you play the game personally uh, i just kind of went with the flow i kind of went with the flow there's a speaker there yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> interfering uh yeah i just kind of sat back and just let, let what happened happen When I originally played this, huh? It, it, it does. It, it should give you pause to evaluate where you are and how you're doing things. When I played this, I heard the guy talk about win-win, talk about teamwork, work together. The answer's right on the board. And I'm sitting there trying to figure it out. I'm like, how does this work? 
what is, I said, there's something to this where how does this work? But I didn't understand how it works. At the same time, there, were, there was a guy like Steve that says, okay, game on, let's go. And they, two, three guys figured out, they said, if we just choose red, we win, no matter what. And they were all strutting their stuff. They're like, yeah, we win. <clears throat> and I'm like, what about the guys out there? Why don't we just go? But I didn't do it. I didn't get up. I didn't go say, hey, come on back in. Let's, let's work together on this. We're not competitive. And so I allowed that to happen, and I sat there and waited. And that's how I did life. Is when something would happen, and, and the easy thing is to make complaints about how I was disadvantaged, how the nothing it wasn't explained, or it wasn't this, or it wasn't that, or the, the, the it wasn't clear, so I didn't get to. This is honestly, when you go out, we, we go out in ministry, when you go out work or business or anything else, you're going to have a partial picture. I think I've read that in a book. There's going to be a partial picture. <coughs> Through the Holy Spirit, we can gain access to the full picture on how it's supposed to be done. But in the meantime, there's going to be pressures there's going to be deadlines. There's going to be people. There's going to be things that want to pull us off course, off of where we're going. What does this have? Where am I going? What does this have to do with that? If you're looking at down a straight line, you can tell what's off. But if you're wandering off in the wilderness, it really doesn't matter. <clears throat> you're gonna have. You're gonna be fed, and things are gonna happen. But you're not gonna reach a promised land because it takes discipline. There's a distraction. There's going to be things to try and pull you off course. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Anything else in this? Lou. Oh, here we go. Uh, one thing is that I, I noticed too was um, uh, the, how the, uh, the undominant personalities didn't say too much. And they didn't. I mean, there was even a time in our group where I gave a suggestion. I looked up and I, and I was looking like, is that okay with everybody? Because I, I remember that from a leadership standpoint, with what you said, everybody needs to have the vote. But some of the people didn't speak up. They just kind of nodded along. So I think... That, that's a good point, Kyle, where sometimes when we feel overwhelmed, we freeze. We don't know what to do, so we just freeze and don't do anything. It's like a, a little kid that gets stuck in a hot shower. They'll freeze because they don't know what to do. They just shut down. And if we get into a situation where there's high pressure, we'll just shut down. And so what do we do naturally is avoid high pressure. We avoid situations that are going to cause pressure. And again, this is an exercise. This is just something to get us to think. That's all this is. I mean, it's not, it's not the gospel. Yeah. Well, actually, what I did was, because I was unsure of the rules that were set before us, I deferred to what I believed was the authority of the group. Yeah, and I, I, wish, I wish I had not been out there. <laughs> I wasn't blaming him, because that's my own, that was my own personal. Yeah, I wasn't blaming him. That was, that was my deferral, and that was my decision. Um, but just because I'm like, I was unaware of the parameters of, of what we were trying to establish. I was like, I just stepped back and watched and then understood that he normally is the authority in which I well, work why under. Did, why would pastor say he wish he wasn't out there? Why do you say that? I'll answer that. <laughs> I see a danger in this exercise in that we would start to, uh, take on guilt or or shame because of our personality and uh, we're, we're valid we're all valid yes. and we're all an important part of it and we need competitive people we need people 
who are step back and supportive people. Well, who are supportive or who step back and look at try to look at the whole picture before they make a actions. Um, people who every kind you all all of the things that were brought up, and I know that as sometimes as we have conversations like this, and I we get the feeling that sometimes that our choices were the wrong ones, mm -hmm. but this this had no sense to it. <laughs> and and so we have to we have to keep we have to not deny who we are, but we have to work together. And so I, I it was fun for me to see Pastor's competitiveness. It, it, Did he get competitive? It, it, and 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 sometimes I'm sometimes I'm. Uh, feel less because I'm not that way, but it's not true. It's, right. See, that, that leads right into the, the parts of the body. We all have certain gifts, and we all form the body. One's a hand, one's a foot, or whatever. I'm analytical. I was looking at the numbers. I deal with numbers five days a week, 10, 12 hours a day, and I was having trouble following exactly what you wanted done because of the lack of a definition of what was you know what was you wanted us to do this gentleman he picked it up Steve yeah where I didn't see it he saw it and I was going up and down he went across did you get it figured out Steve Not till after. so it's a different gifting <laughs> right <laughs> but without everybody talking I'm not even sure if <clears throat> he would have picked it up as early as he did does that make sense mm-hmm I would have got it if we had had more time. I think probably this room would have got it mm -hmm. yeah. if we had more time. You did. There was no time. Right. So I think this is something that I'm, I preach a lot. You had all is the time If you, you are making no. decisions from pressure, if you're making decisions from emotion, if you're making decisions from, you are not making decisions because of the Holy Spirit. I don't, nobody probably made a decision in this room because the Holy Spirit whispered anything in their ear right. because <laughs> I can prove it because we lost. Yes. Nobody won. The Holy Spirit will always lead us into triumph. Amen. We're at a church function Great. with a bunch of spirit filled Christians. Is this, is this going too deep? <laughs> and we lost. Mm -hmm. The work together oh, game. We didn't do this. We're leaving because we're, we're coming to an understanding of the process. You so lost. We, no. <laughs> and she's an exhorter. Hey. The reality is, is that we lost. We did not hear what the Holy Spirit had to say to the church. We were not led by the comforter. The helper did not help us because we rejected him. <laughs> And we lost. You can twist this. You can turn this. You can politicize it. The facts are is that we, Christians, all in a room together, prayerfully considered what we were doing. We're told by the leader of the, the Christian leader of the Christian group. Of the Christian game. And we all, we all sided with the devil. <laughs> Give Pastor Steve a hand, all right? Give him a hand. You know. Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, honestly, you know, I mean, I don't know how pastors, how long pastors been pastoring, you know, due respect to pastor and apostle down there, you know, in the eight and a half years that I've been doing this, situations like this come up all of the time, right. all the time, whether it's. And what do you do? Right, you exactly. Well, that's my point. Whether it's and, and you guys have never heard you guys think out there in the hallway or in here was intense. You should be in Lynette and I's bedroom sometimes. <laughs> no, I'm serious about it. And so, so to Steve's point, you just have to back off. Yeah. And, and it's, it's okay. You have permission not to play. You know what I'm saying? And, and we have to be willing to accept those people who are not wanting to play. Apostle said, 
I'm not into confusion. Okay, there's still X, Y, Z of us still that can get this done. And, but because we, because we feel the pressure and we want to win, we miss out on God's best, which is simply, I love the fact that Lynette and I, or, or even in some of our team meetings, we don't always see agree. But by the time the night is over, we're back in the unity of the faith. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't come up with the right winning answer that time, let's come back and do it again. Mm -hmm. But let's let every meeting like this <clears throat> build upon the previous one so that when we get done with he this, so we have an organization of people that are that man. You should have saw us back in that first conference back in, in when we were in the Radisson in that long, hot, narrow, cold room. <laughs> right. And that's what God wants. He wants, he's already given us the success, but times like this prove who we really are and that we do have to be sensitive in like a generation never before to all the things that God is saying. And this is a, this is a great exercise. You know, I don't think the directions were great, but no, I'm just kidding. But I say that, no, seriously, I say that because I get it. You know, I don't want to use that as an excuse. I want to look at it like from, from, from Randy's standpoint, from, from Christine, whoever, that, you know, every, everything is valid. Every, I think, what, was, it, was it Levi's that built jeans out of excess material yeah. from a guy that was on the loading dock and they were throwing it away? You know, if we don't listen to these ideas, if we don't bring all this stuff to the table so, and we don't give in, we're not going to be successful. So what should have Tommy done? What should the pastor have done? Nothing. Pastor should have, huh? Nothing. He shouldn't have had to do anything. We're believers. We, we know about working together in anything. Now, in a certain setting, yeah, maybe, you know, guide and, and teach and everything. But in this case, be there for support, but should have. So he could have stepped do. back and allowed you all to figure it out yeah. or, or step up and, and make a decision. And it's not right or wrong, right? right? That's right. But it just, it's revelation. It's revealed. This is you know, where we need to grow. He needs to grow and pull him back and uh, allow you to hit the wall. Allow your van to get stolen and crashed. <laughs> Figuratively. <clears throat> That's fine. Just two things. One was... Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, what Steve said, now I've lost my train of thought. Um, Well, I'll forget that one for now. I'll, it'll come up later, maybe. But um, th how f the example of this game? How much of the pressures we feel in real life are e e e and, and not real? Like the pressure, the time pressure. He didn't give us a time limit, but we put ourselves under those pressures sometimes. And Satan's putting pressure all the time, and. We just need to remember that they're, they're not. So when, you, when you're looking out to do evangelistic work, this is the picture that you work with. You, you're not going to have it all, but you have enough. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you will find when the demand is made, you will see the right device in order to use in order to get someone to come in. I can't do it. I don't live in Iowa. I don't know the people in this 380 corridor. I don't know them. You do. Um, I think there's uh, <clears throat> something that's really valuable also that's a takeaway here is this game didn't matter. Yep. There was no prize. He didn't say, you know, like if if we win, we get 10 bucks. You know, uh, this, w this had zero reward there was no uh you weren't going to get cast out into outer darkness if you didn't win you you weren't it wasn't heaven and hell it wasn't money it wasn't uh health or unhealthy which means that all of the other decisions that we make in our life are actually more important than what this was and we couldn't sort this I mean, how many of us, like, literally, like, this is, this is really humiliating to me. It, I mean, it really is, and we should be, um, 
we should take we should take great stock in the fact that we we were given an opportunity to make a decision that had really no impact in our lives whatsoever and we boned it how much more when we have to make decisions under pressure without enough information um, because it really has to be done that have to do with our financial future that have to do with our health that have to do with the prophetic that the way that God is leading us have to do with our feelings instead of what the Holy Spirit has to say family your family the direction of your family I have literally seen people move from state to state uproot their family move from state to state not have a church not have it because they were going to make five dollars an hour more the entire course of their family, their finances, their health, their future, their destiny, their purpose in life, everything was determined by $5 an hour. And I know everybody in this, oh no, not me, I'm way more spiritual than that. Bull. <laughs> Apparently Bull. not. Because <laughs> we're, we're not, we do it all the time. We do it every day. We make decisions that have way more magnitude than this one based upon how we feel or what's going on or what little information we have or what Facebook told us to say. Um, I can't remember who I, I heard say it, but the, you know, when, when suddenly you're in, in the fray of whatever's going on in the world, you, you go back to what you're used to doing. Mm. And I think about how, uh, for this game, it, it triggered it when, um, when he asked what pastor should do, and I agree, pastor didn't have to do anything, but as a group, what if we had prayed right. first? And when, when, the, when things get rough, sometimes we jump in to compete or jump in to to problem solve or jump in to try to keep the try to keep the chaos you know try to bring peace but we I've done this with a bunch of different groups Randy nobody has ever done that to pray first yeah none yeah. <laughs> and we're the Christians That cracks me up. Oh, my. I just wanted to say, you know, along with Randy's point, you know, think about how many churches don't even invite the Holy Spirit in. And they're making all these different decisions. And I think if we looked at it, we think, oh, it's just natural. It's just a game. It's just fun. We don't need to pray about that. We don't need to. Oh. Holy Spirit, give us the answer. What's going on here? Um, so to me, just for me, it just let me know how much more important that is, even though it seemed like it's just no big deal. I can figure that out on my own natural mind. We can figure it out on our own natural mind and get this solved. No big deal. But it lets us know we're, we're nothing without the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us. <clears throat> so, what I what I hope to do this this sort of ministry that I do is is a lot really is a lot experiential. It's going through something. I would rather have us experience something, and feel it, and be involved, and in, than than not. You know, to to really have emotions stirred up. To me, it helps me remember what what happened. Don't forget this time, and don't. Don't think just because, you know, think just don't think just because someone said, okay, this is the way that that's necessarily how you have to do it. Just because there's pressure, you don't have to make a decision. You don't have to do anything, really. I understand there's there's parameters, but 
you have time to think. You have time to pray. You have time to consult the Holy Spirit about what to do. There is time for that. Take time. Own your territory. Own your ground. The, it is really the only way you're going to be able to stay out of and, 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 and attack your comfort zone to get out of your comfort zone is to know who you are, to know it's okay. You know, and it's, it's things like this that help reveal that. Was there anybody else had anything to say? Romans 8 and 1. <clears throat> what? Romans 8 and 1. Romans 8 and 1. Yeah, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We're, we're, on the, we're on the same team. We're on the same team. Isn't that great? Amen. So... This is Three Degrees Ministry, and Three Degrees, I forgot about that. if you're out in the boondocks, can be a major variation, and I like to go to the boondocks, and I need to know how to run my compass, because if I don't know how to run the compass, I'll be off more than Three Degrees. And I could be in major doo-doo. <laughs> if, if that term's too uh, vague, I, I can... Right. We got it. But you have to realize you're in charge. And if you can get it together, you can dig your way out. Don't panic. Just say, okay, what have I got to do next? Sooner or later, you'll probably get where you want to be. And if you don't, well, there might be somebody coming the other direction that can help you out there too. Pray. Wow, that's usually the last thing people think of, Jack, but that's the most important one anyway. <laughs> Years ago, there was a Korean airliner that took off from Korea, and it, it was three degrees off on its heading. It ended up over Russia, and Russia shot it down with all the passengers on board, only because it was three degrees off. So what happens is you start out, and you think everything is great. Over time of doing things that same way, you farther and farther you get off. I'm going to talk about this probably tonight if I have time. You get off track where you're in the wilderness and you're no longer on track to where you're going. And it's just because of that three degrees getting off. That's, that's what we, we want to make corrections. Correction is good. Bible's really clear on correction is great. And we need to, be, need to have that correction. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this. I'm glad I made some people mad. We're going to break a little bit early. <coughs> and... Uh, would someone like to pray us out, please? Can I ask, can I ask a really quick question? Yes. Um, since there's so many prayer warriors in this room, I really need a healing. I'm an interpreter. My shoulder, my rotator cuff has been torn. Um, so I'm having a lot of trouble with my arm and my, my shoulder. And I really don't want surgery. Um, that would put me out of commission for four to six weeks. I can't do that. Um, it's given me a lot of pain recently. And I really, really would love to have all of you kind of just to agree with me <laughs> that um, God's going to really touch my arm and my, my shoulder. And I've got a couple other issues too, but I thought I won't be back tonight. Um, I've got other things I've got to get. Um, I'm doing workshops and stuff this afternoon, but... I would really covet your, your prayers, and um, I know you guys are wonderful so, prayer warriors. So about three or four people have been assigned to you after we're going to break, yes. and they're going to come over to you and pray and heal awesome. what's going on, and, and heal the rotator cuff, and you can go on and not be uh, in pain. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Lord, for this time, God. Thank you for drawing our hearts here again. Thank you for new strength. 
Thank you for revelation, Lord. Thank you for reminding us what it means to work together. God, uh, we just release your uh, conviction, your conviction on our hearts, Father, what, you are, what you've presented to us thus far and what you're going to seal uh, for the remainder of today, God. Be with us in our time of break, Father, that there is peace and safety and that it's to your glory, Lord. And we just receive everything that you've given us, Lord. Help it to continue in our hearts that we do not lose uh, the information you are wanting to give us today, God, that we go deeper in your wisdom, deeper in your discernment, uh, that we draw on a closer relationship with you. And Jesus, we look more and more like you, that this is not time Time wasted that we're not going to walk out this door forgetting what you've given us we're not going to walk away from the mirror and forget what you have revealed to us what we look like Lord but we are seeking to look like you more and more and more God and for every vision and every dream that you have put on hearts God that have come in and out of this room father for uh, the manifestation of your blessing your gifting uh, where you're taking us through business through endeavors through ministry through personal growth. God, let those things come to life through this. I speak blessing now, Father, over those ministering. Uh, Father, Pastor Randy, Pastor Steve, and, and even Pastor Steve that has said some interjections today and others who have said interjections, Lord, I speak blessing over them. God, that they would continue in your presence and be sensitive and remain sensitive to your Holy Spirit, continuing to reveal your truth. In Jesus' name.